the fact that all your great-grandparents live long enough to have children makes it almost a miracle that any of us are here today. Many of our great-grandparents were alive in the late 19th century, and they often lived what we consider now a fairly long life. However, during their time, the average life expectancy in the US was a mere 44 years, and in the UK it was 47. So death was a familiar visitor to their households and neighborhoods. How did they manage to avoid it for so long? In this video, I'll provide an insight into life and more notably death in the 19th century and how it might have impacted your family history. I'll focus on data from the US with the sources listed in the comments below, but it's worth noting that the UK and most of Europe had similar situations. That is apart from the impact of race and migration, which as we'll see later, significantly affected average life expectancy in the US. Let's journey back to 1890. The average death rate stood at nearly 2,000 deaths for every 100,000 people in that year, with an average life expectancy of just 44 years. For comparison, pre-COVID 2019 data gives a US life expectancy of 78 and a death rate of 724 people per 100,000, a third of the 1890 figures. However, these statistics can be very deceiving. Consider my great-grandparents, for example. All born in the late 19th century, they all reached ages that would seem ordinary by even today's standards, with an average age at death of 73. Charles Layton died from a tragic fall, so that's affected the numbers even more. They all resided in a relatively large, unhealthy English cities and were firmly entrenched in the working classes. They were exposed to the relatively bad living conditions of the time. But perhaps my family is an exception. Let's examine some other 19th century families, such as the great-grandparents of the current King Charles III. As we can see, their average age at death was 77, nearly what it would be expected today. And some of his ancestors enjoyed a really long life. However, this was an extraordinarily wealthy and well-supported family and still is, so they were isolated from the filth and poverty of the 19th century. So let's look at a vastly different scenario, Elvis Presley. Elvis, even though he was the king of rock and roll, couldn't be more different from King Charles III, yet his 19th century great-grandparents had an average age at death of 74, and they led a relatively modest life in rural Mississippi. So how do we reconcile the fact that the average life expectancy was 44, yet many individuals in our families lived to their twilight years? To understand this paradox, let's scrutinize the causes of death in the 1890s, which may hold the clues we need. Let's compare 1890 with 2019. Except for heart disease, the death rates as we would expect were lower across the board for 2019. New diseases have emerged while others have been eradicated. In 1890, numerous contagious diseases wreaked havoc, whereas in 2019, most were not transmissible from person to person. Because 1890 predates the invention of antibiotics, and the result diseases like pneumonia, now often secondary, were major killers. Waves of diseases like typhoid and cholera claimed at least 25% of victims, a far cry from the 1% we see today. These diseases in 1890 disproportionately affected the young and vulnerable. Let's delve deeper into some of the significant causes of death in 1890 that are now rare in the US. As depicted in the chat, tuberculosis, also known as consumption or TB, was the leading cause of death. It earned the nickname White Death due to the paleness of its victims and often associated with vampirism, to be honest. The risk of contracting TB was at its highest between the ages of 12 and 24. It spread through the air when the infected person coughed or sneezes. Cramped and unsanitary living conditions provided an ideal breeding ground for this disease. Deaths from diarrhea caused by diseases such as cholera and dysentery were often caused by contaminated food or water. 
Epidemics caused by insanitary conditions killed tens of thousands at a time. And these diseases were particularly deadly for infants, rapidly causing dehydration and death. Another disease that we don't hear of at all today is cholera infantum. Although unrelated to cholera, it shares very similar symptoms. It was often called a summer disease as it struck babies and infants during the hot summer months, causing high fever, diarrhea, leading to death in about 30% of children under two. Its exact causes remain unclear, but it was likely a stomach infection from tainted milk or food. And finally, diphtheria. Diphtheria posed a significant health threat in 19th century America, especially to children under five. Regular diphtheria epidemics occurred and there was no cure at the time. Again, spread through coughing and sneezing. Luckily, effective vaccinations have nearly eradicated this disease in the US. Because of their impact on the very young, these diseases had a profound impact on the average life expectancy in the 1890s. Fortunately, for the most part, they've been almost eliminated by insignificant improvements in living conditions, especially in big cities. Let's look at how they affect people by age. This chart shows that these contagious diseases, especially amongst children under one, had an exceedingly high mortality rate compared to individuals between 15 and 44. This begins to unravel the story of how infant deaths disproportionately influenced the average age in 1890. Indeed, reaching marital age significantly improved one's chances of living to an old age. Consequently, when examining our great-grandparents, many of them managed to attain old age as they obviously built up an immunity to many of the diseases that are around them by their late teens. Family historians must also consider that tracing these 19th century infant deaths can be challenging, making it difficult to account for all the children accurately. Some families even reuse the names of deceased children, further complicating family research. It should also be noted at this time, people living in rural areas had a longer life expectancy than those living in a city, and it remained that way until the 1920s and 1930s, as sanitation improved. Lastly, I'd like to show one more table illustrating maternal death rates by age, ethnicity and birthplace. As I previously mentioned, these figures barely a generation after emancipation reveal that African American mortality rates, again especially amongst children, were twice as high as those for white mothers. Also interesting are the death rates for immigrants by nationality. I can't explain the peaking numbers for mothers born in France or Canada, so it might be worthwhile for those with French or Canadian ancestry to investigate this further. Now I hope this video has given you some brief context into the lives of your ancestors in the 19th century. Please like and share so I know this content is relevant, and of course subscribe to be alerted to new videos. And, of course, have a great day.